So we've got to have the producer surplus and then the consumer surplus. So the producer surplus is PQ minus S of pi. So. <coughs> yes, that's that's uh, that's not quite right because it's the area underneath the supply curve, right? Or to the to the left of the supply curve, right? Consumer surplus. The consumer surplus is the integral for the quantity produced of the um, demand curve minus yep. the quantity. Yeah, so that's already captured okay. here. You just have to multiply it by the supply of innovations, right? Because you earn this consumer surplus on every innovation that's created, and no consumer surplus on the innovations that aren't created, right? Okay. So it's S of pi of P times consumer surplus of P plus this integral of the supply function that you talked about. Great. Um, OK. So uh, let's take the first order condition for this. Alex? Is Alex? Okay. Yes. Um, so you want to take s pi d pi right? Yep, when you take the derivative of this, you get pi prime times s of p, right? right? And then how about this one? Um, you would get, taking it into the p, mm -hmm. yeah. so you would take, you would get cs prime p plus, or times s yeah. plus pi prime p times s. Yeah, s prime pi yeah. prime. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly right. So you get... Uh, you get pi prime, pi prime times s, right? Plus cs prime times s, plus pi prime s prime times cs. And if we let the dead weight loss be the difference between the consumer surplus when the price is the optimal price of zero, and the consumer surplus when the price is p, then the derivative of dead weight loss, right, is the negative of CS prime uh, and plus pi prime, right? And so we can use that to group together uh, this term and this term, right? You're going to have pi prime, uh, sorry, to group together these two terms, you're going to get uh, dead weight loss prime times S. Right? Negative dead weight loss prime times S. So this whole expression becomes pi prime S prime CS is equal to dead weight loss prime times S. And this leads to um, an elasticity formula just like Becker's, um, which is this. So this is almost exactly the same as what we saw before. The elasticity of innovation supply, which we get by dividing by s and then multiplying both top and bottom by pi, uh, times the ratio of consumer surplus to profits is equal to the ratio of the marginal dead weight loss to the marginal profits. So this is, again, the elasticity of supply, just like we had for uh, criminal offenses. This is the amount of value created, the ratio of consumer surplus to profits, and then this is the uh, marginal cost of incentives, which is the amount of dead the, that it caught, the amount of dead weight loss created for every unit of profit that we generate, right? Um, and th this confirms the basic intuitions that we came into this with. So, Anthony, what comparative statics can we derive from this this model analogous to the ones we did for uh, the crime bomb. Well, like, uh, if the elasticity is higher, then we want to, like, give them more, give the firms more 
monopoly power because a absolutely. And then it's the consumer surplus from that is higher, and we also want to do that. Right? Yeah. If the deadweight loss is uh, if the deadweight loss is high, then we don't want to. Exactly. So that's exactly the sort of intuition that we came into this with, and that's exactly what the formula confirms. So the higher the elasticity, the more profits for every unit of dead weight loss, and the more cons uh, consumer surplus for every unit of dead weight loss, the more we're going to want to do this. So um, one useful way to sort of play around with this is um, to remember that the pass-through determines the ratio of dead weight loss to profits. And so we can just play around with this by trying constant pass-through demand form. Uh, this includes constant elasticity, exponential, and linear as special cases, and it looks like this. You don't really need to know this formula, but this is just the formula for any constant pass-through demand function. Um, to the extent that we have evidence on this, there's not great studies, but it indicates that elasticity of innovation supply is around 0.5 to 1. Um, evidence on pass-through is even weaker, but it's probably somewhere usually between 0.5 and 2. And so we can plug these in and figure out what intele op optimal intellectual property is. And uh, these graphs do that. So this graphs the left and the right-hand side of this equation using that particular demand form and that elasticity. So on the left, um, Uh, we, I've, the, the higher curves have a higher pass-through. On the right, the higher curve has a higher um, elasticity. And what I've done is I've graphed um, the value of the left and the right-hand side against the degree of protection, the fraction of the monopoly optimal price that we have to guide charge. Right? Okay. So this gives us exactly the comparative statics we want, which is that if the pass-through rate increases, that means there's more dead weight loss for each unit of profit, we should expect the amount of protection to fall. And that's exactly what we see. On the other hand, if the elasticity increases, the optimal amount of intellectual property protection uh, is, rises. And what I did is that I started with the lowest elasticity number here, and then the highest pass-through here, so the lowest in the range of parameters we get is about 0.45 for the optimal degree of protection. Here I have the low pass-through rate, and um, then I consider the high elasticity, and the highest we get is about 0.65. So what that indicates is optimal intellectual property protection should be somewhere between about 0.45 and 0.65. And what do we actually see in practice? Well, U.S. patent life is about 20 years. Um, Assuming a 5% interest rate, then we can compute what is the fraction of like having the monopoly right forever, which you get by having it for 20 years. Right? We can figure out what the discount, total discounted value of infinity time versus 20 years, and you get that it's about 0.64, the current regime. So that's you know pretty pretty darn close to the range we were talking about especially given that intellectual property protection is somewhat incomplete. You don't get like 100% monopoly power during the time when you have the patent. This is coming pretty darn close to, to what we would say was optimal. Um, so uh, to the extent that different parts of the um, patent system um, have uh, <coughs> different ratios of benefits to harms, we should probably uh, have different regimes for in enforcing patents. So for example, to the extent that a product is super valuable, that there's a lot of inframarginal consumer surplus, we should give higher patent protections. To the extent that there's a lot of follow-on innovations that would be discouraged, we should probably give lower patent protections. Drugs have a huge amount of inframarginal consumer surplus because prices are held down by governments and various things. So probably giving stronger patent protection to drugs than they currently have would be beneficial. On the other hand, in the high-tech sector, there's so much follow-on innovation that having those patents can really reduce things and probably patent protection should be weaker in the um, high-tech sector. And those are both conclusions that have become sort of 
popular recently that we can understand in terms of this model. Yeah, Andy. I was just curious about what about um, the intellectual properties, especially related to drugs, yeah. um, that has true side effects that was unknown yeah. when, uh, when it obtained patent. So yeah. I was like uh, randomly watching videos and I, I yeah. don't know why it came up, but uh, there was uh, an incident in Germany like uh, 20 or 30 years ago when people were, uh, or, or with pregnant women, were taking drugs to um, to uh, mediate the effect of like, nausea. Um, and it created uh, autism. Exactly. Yeah. So what, what happens then? Um, well, I think you should have intellectual property rights for learning about side effects of drugs. So if you could license or earn some profit off of removing the drug from the market, or diagnostics, which don't really get much protection right now, I think that that would greatly improve the way the, the market works. So, um, uh, so, To some extent, just the way that things are enforced does create slightly different intellectual property regimes across these different areas. But likely, we there should be something built formally into the structure of the law, and during the recent patent reform, there's a lot of people talking about trying to explicitly treat differently the tech sector versus the medical sector. Um, okay, so um, while I think that the trade-off that we just emphasized, encouraging innovation but reducing dead weight loss, is sort of the most fundamental trade-off in IP, there's lots of other tools that can encourage innovation, and they have different trade-offs associated with them. So one thing you can do is you can give research and development subsidies. And the government does a lot of this. They give R&D tax credits or explicit grants. Uh, the NSF gives out money for coming up with uh, new, uh, new research. Also, to some extent, because it's considered very good PR to be doing a lot of this research, a lot of companies do it just to curry favor with the public. Prizes or buyouts of patents are another way to encourage innovation. Historically, these were really popular. The French government and the British government gave lots of prizes for coming up with uh, different things, like a way to measure longitude, etc. And the X prizes are sort of recently trying to uh, imitate that. Another way is you can subsidize the purchases of innovative products. So, for example, a lot of people say, well, we should give subsidies for buying green technology, not just because uh, it's environmentally friendly, but because it will encourage people to create new green technologies if they knew there, know there will be a large market for them. You can determine the length versus the breadth of patents, right? So you can both figure out how long they're going to last, but also how strong the protection is going to be, how many potential infringers uh, you could bring a suit against. There's also these requirements that uh, in order to get a patent, something has to be novel, useful, like you can make a real product out of it, and non-obvious. And by changing how those requirements are interpreted, you can affect patent policy. Um, and finally, there's various policies which can affect the division of profits that come from two sequential innovations that build on top of one another. So if you, you know, patent a gene, but then I figure out a treatment based on that, which one of us gets the profits associated with that eventual treatment? Well, that's determined by how the courts enforce, uh, you know, the agreements between the two sides, and that, uh, and that's a big part of um, that's a big part of patent policy and patent pools. When we put all our, our patents together into one group. Uh, can, can play an important role in that process as well. So each one of these different tools that we can use brings a different set of trade-offs than the exact ones we were thinking about. So if you think about R&D subsidies, the benefit is this can help internalize a lot of the consumer <coughs> surplus. Uh, you know, we know that even once we've given IP protection, there will still be a lot of inframarginal consumer surplus that the firm's generating but it's not capturing, and giving them subsidies for R&D can help internalize this. But it may also be a giveaway to business, right? And may uh, therefore raise, um, you know, give away a lot of the government's.